Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. In 2009, a flu pandemic started. The H1N1 virus, more commonly known as the swine flu, was on the rise. Many countries worldwide, including Great Britain, were looking for ways to protect their population. There seemed to be one main option, the antiviral drug Oseltamivir, better known under its brand name Tamiflu. The British government spent over 500 million pounds to stockpile the medicine. The problem is, Oseltamivir seems not to significantly reduce the effects of the flu. In April 2014, the Cochrane Collaboration, an independent research network, together with a British medical journal, published a review of the effects of the drug. Their conclusion? Oseltamivir can reduce the duration of flu symptoms in healthy adults by about half a day. It does not influence the outcome of more severe complications. How is it possible that governments worldwide spent millions of dollars on a drug that had not been sufficiently proven to be effective? This is the story at the heart of Fiona Gottlieb's talk, Conflicts of Interest in Public Health. Gottlieb is editor-in-chief of the British Medical Journal. In her talk, she recounts the story of how the British Medical Journal tried to gain access to all available data from studies of Oseltamivir and the huge obstacles they encountered. To protect the public's best interest when it comes to questions of health, a lot has to happen, Godley concludes. We need new legislation, professional sanctions and a culture change. Godley gave her talk at the Herrenhausen Workshop Interessenkonflikte in den modernen Lebenswissenschaften on March 4th, 2013. The workshop was organized by the Volkswagen Foundation and took place in Hanover, Germany. Okay, I think we should continue. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Fiona Gottlieb. She qualified as a doctor in 1985 trained as a general physician in Cambridge and London, and as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. Since joining the BMJ in 1919, she, was, she has written a lot of relevant papers and has contributed to a broad range of issues, including the impact of environmental degradation on health, the future of the WHO, the ethics of academic publication, and the problems of editorial peer review, and in my welcome address, I mentioned some more recent areas. In 1994, she spent a year at the Harvard University as a Harkness Fellow, evaluating efforts to bridge a gap between medical research and practice. And on returning to the UK, she led the development of the BMJ Clinical Evidence Initiative, which evaluates the best available evidence on the benefits and harms of treatment, and this is also the source is also used broadly in Germany, as you probably know. Now, in 2005, she became editor in chief of the British Medical Journal, and I learned that he was the first female editor of the British Medical Journal. Congratulations! <laughs> on the other hand, it's sad that this not has happened before. She has served as president of the World Association of Medical Editors and chair of the Committee on Publication Ethics and is co-editor of Peer Review in Health Sciences. And now we are looking forward to your talk, Conflict of Interest in Public Health. Fiona, thank you very much for coming to Germany. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Is this working? Yes, great. I'm not going to wear it with quite the elegance that Eric did, but it's, um, I'll do my best. Um, I was asked to talk about conflict of interest in public health, and it was quite a, an interesting thought process I had to go through in thinking about this talk, because my natural instincts will go down the clinical practice kind of route. And um, so I'd be interested to find out what I'm going to talk about. I'm sure you will be too. Um, but the first thing that um, occurred to me was to mention this man. I don't know if you know who this is. Henrik Ibsen. Ah. So now you know why I mention him. Um, enemy of the people, it strikes me as a perfect uh, beginning to thinking about public health and conflict of interest. Um, the enemy of the people you all know is a play about um, a doctor who is the sort of hero of a play about political corruption. And um, the context is that the baths in the town where he lives 
um, are the future. So everyone there is thrilled and they're going to make lots of money from this, um, this hydrotherapy at these baths. Um, and our hero, or rather the enemy of the people so-called, um, understands that the baths are tainted and poisoned, infected, and um, has to try to fight for the public interest uh, against enormous commercial interests. So I think it's a, maybe a beginning to try to think about what we mean by damaging conflict of interest. And someone mentioned, what is the primary interest? I thought that was a very interesting question. What is the primary interest if all the other interests are conflicts of interest? And I would say that the primary interest is in the patient and the public's best interest. And anything else in terms of medicine and science, I would argue, is um, a conflict of interest, something that might lead you to make a a decision or a choice which is not in the patient or the public's best interest. I'm not saying that that's simple at all, but that would be my answer. Um, now, um, I thought it would be quite helpful just to tell one story in which I've been closely involved in the last few years, um, and then I'll move on to um, other examples of uh, conflicts of interest that have been um, troublesome to the public health. And this one um, is... Uh, relates to uh, the, the, the obvious conflict of interest in this story is that it turned out that the author of an article in The Lancet in 1998 had an undeclared conflict of interest. Andrew Wakefield had been providing legal advice to parents of children who were um, apparently damaged by the um, MMR vaccine. And he didn't declare this when he published the paper in The Lancet. So rightly, The Lancet's editors were very cross and felt misled, as did the public. Um, but it turned out that there were other, many other more damaging problems with that study. And um, I mention it because um, it did, did have quite a dramatic effect on the public health with reduction in malaria, uh, MMR vaccine and some deaths, but certainly a great deal of suspicion and um, damage to people's views about uh, vaccination in general. Um, and eventually the paper was retracted. But between the publication of the paper in 1998 and the retraction of the paper in 2011, um, there was uh, obviously an enormous delay. But in addition to that, there were signals that this paper was problematic right from the start. And so the other conflict of interest I want to talk about is the journal. And um, in this case, um, the question was not only what, as we discovered that the MMR vaccine research had itself been um, manipulated um, and that it had been in order to make Andrew Wakefield a large amount of money, but also that The Lancet um, did not speak up when the first problems were uh, emerged. And I raise this not to be specifically critical of The Lancet, although I think they do bear some criticism here, but because I think we as journal editors need to understand how we become invested in the research we may publish and how difficult it can be sometimes to step back and say, OK, we need to get some other people to come in and look at this. Um, so um, in the end, the paper was retracted. The BMJ published uh, the work of Brian Deere, who's an investigative journalist, which showed not only was the paper a very bad paper in the first place, but also actually fraudulent. Um, and in the process of the follow-up of this and a great deal of attack on, Andrew, on Brian Deere and on the BMJ for uh, publishing Brian Deere's work and raising all of this, um, we're, now being, we're currently being sued by Andrew Wakefield for what we published. Um, one of the criticisms of the BMJ, so this is my third conflict of interest in relation to this story, was that we were receiving money from the creators of the MMR vaccine, both Merck and GSK, and that we hadn't told the world this when we published this work. Now, I claim, and it's entirely honest and true, that we didn't declare this conflict of interest because it didn't occur to us. But actually, that's no excuse. Um, and quite rightly, we were criticized for this, I think. And we published a correction to um, the editorial that I wrote alongside the work around the fraud of Andrew Wakefield's work, saying we should have said the BMJ receives money from Merck, the BMJ receives money from GSK. Um, it, it, in my best, to, to the best of my knowledge, this hasn't influenced what we uh, said about the vaccine. And I, I think, indeed, the BMJ's record is that we are largely very critical of the drug industry. So uh, the fact that we have published investigative journalism which seems to support the vaccine, um, it, I would say, has nothing to do with the fact that we have these relationships. But 
we, we should have declared them, and, and we have now done so. So there we go. In one small story, one large story, three different types of conflict of interest. The author's legal conflict of interest undeclared. The journal, Lancet's conflict of interest, invested in the research, failing, I would say, to step back when there was concerns of the research, taking 12 years to retract the research against quite a lot of criticism. And thirdly, the BMJ coming in after the event, uh, helping to reveal that there was a fraud, and failing to declare our own links to the vaccine manufacturer. <sighs> there we go. <laughs> Life isn't really as simple as it might seem. So conflicts of interest, many and various. We have uh, commercial conflicts of interest. There's with the drug industry, tobacco industry, the food industry, alcohol industry. We have professional conflicts of interest, intellectual, passion, uh, investment in, a, in an idea, career advancement, financial interests, and also those linking to the health systems. Um, in which doctors work. So we've mentioned earlier fee-for-service as an example, where if you're a, a gynaecologist um, and a woman comes to you with menorrhagia, you're going to do the hysterectomy rather than necessarily refer her to uh, someone else who might do something else. So the whole idea of supplier-induced demand is an area that is hugely important, and I'm afraid not one that I will spend a lot of time on, but I, I flag it up here um, for completeness' sake. Uh, the other thing is that uh, conflict of interest, in my view, is both simple and complex. The simple thing is people should declare it and people should um, try and avoid having them. But we know that life isn't quite so straightforward. We all have conflicts of interest. It's what we do with them that matters. Um, so what do we want people to declare? Uh, we want to... Uh, a lot of questions around this. It's not quite clear. How, how far back in their lives do we want them to go? How much money matters? Bernard mentioned, you know, the bigger the, the bigger the amount of money, the more important, and I, I would agree with that. Uh, but where is the cutoff? Um, and how much should we worry about non-financial conflicts of interest? Um, those are questions which I think it's fair to say there isn't a lot of agreement about. Um, and how do we act on disclosed information? So it seems to me there are three options. You can um, disclose. You can say that disclosure itself is enough. Uh, simply to say I received a million pounds from Merck um, for such and such a piece of work, uh, and you can carry on believing me that that's enough. Some people would say that disclosure is followed by a judgment of some sort about the potential conflict of interest, and so there's a sort of subjective element to wh when can you still trust the person not to have been influenced and when should you um, take action. And a third view, a rather more extreme view, although it's the one I personally hold, is that disclosure of conflict is a bar to taking part in certain activities. Um, for example, membership of a panel, authorship of an editorial, um, involvement in a piece of research. There, there are um, levels at which one would just say no. And as a journal editor, we, kind of, we hold that to some extent for our readers. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Do we do enough, journal editors? Are, are we being fierce enough? Um, and then a the question, what do we do about failure to declare? When does non-disclosure become fraud? When is it intentional in, in order to hide something? Um, and as Bernard and I were discussing earlier, when does allowing a conflict of interest to affect your behavior as a researcher or a clinician become fraud? So data manipulation of a study and you're paid by the drug company, when does that become fraud? Um, and, um, I'm a doctor and I prescribe a certain drug rather than a different drug. Um, and when does that become clinical misconduct. Now, some people listening to this, I don't know if there are many in this room, but there will be people who think, gosh, this has all just gone far too far. And um, Thomas Stossel is one person who thinks that, and I've been up, up speaking on panels with him, and he has a very clear view, uh, which he states with a great deal of um, gusto, that we've all gone bonkers, and clinicians and researchers are quite entitled to take money from whoever they please, and we should let their behavior and their output speak for themselves. Uh, but we had another view uh, from um, Kirby Lee saying quite the reverse, and I, I have to say I'm of this view that not only have we not gone too far, I don't think we've gone far enough. Um, and just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know about the influence of pharmaceutical um, links with industry on authors of reviews and letters. This is a very, I think, a very important piece of work published in the New England Journal back in uh, 1998, so it's quite old now, but it really shows that um, those authors of uh, reviews and letters um, who had links with industry were statistically more significantly more likely 
to support the use of this controversial treatment than those without those links. Um, and that's been found in other areas too. So this was with um, calcium channel blockers, but other controversial medicines, in particular where there's controversy, we can show these, these effects quite clearly. And I think we, um, you know, I think these, these are, this is a good study and there are others that come to the same conclusion. Um, influence on meta-analysis, we've talked about uh, earlier. Um, I think, Bernard, you quoted this figure, four times more likely to have results favourable to the sponsor. And this is one from the tobacco industry. Why review articles on the health effects of pas passive smoking reach different conclusions from Lisa Barrow um, and colleagues in JAMA. These, these, you know, these are quite old studies, but they do show the behavioural effect of the links. Um, so I just wanted to bring this up to date, and apologies to those of you who know the story. Uh, inside out. Um, I think it does bear repeating because it has become a bit iconic um, and a bit um, emblematic of a many different aspects of the conflict of interest story. So um, just to set the context, we're talking about back in 2009 when the uh, flu pandemic, um, H1N1, was just on the rise. And in the UK, the uh, National Institutes for Health Research uh, commissioned the Cochrane collaboration review group on antivirals to update their Cochrane review. So Tom Jefferson and colleagues had done the previous review, they had published it in The Lancet, and it had, it had come to the conclusion that um, neuraminidase inhibitors, in particular oseltamivir, did reduce complications. So if you, have, if you had a flu infection and you took this drug, this antiviral drug, you were less likely to end up in hospital with pneumonia or bronchitis. And, and I suppose the assumption is you're less likely then to die from complications of flu. So when they were asked by the um, National Institutes of Health and Clinical, uh, sorry, the National Institute of Health Research to update their review, they thought it would be a very simple job. They'd just simply look for research that was published since their previous review and incorporate that and probably come to the same conclusion. But when they went to look on the Cochrane Library, they found that they'd received one response from a paediatrician in Japan who pointed out that, um, in case they hadn't noticed it, that the evidence on which they'd based their previous review uh, was 10 randomised trials, all of which were performed by Roche employees or by Roche-funded experts, um, and only two of which, only two of these 10 trials had actually been published in full, uh, one in JAMA, one in The Lancet. The other eight, including one of the larger of the 10 trials, were published only in abstract form. Um, and this Japanese pediatrician just gently pointed out maybe they would like to um, see the data just to confirm that they were happy with this situation. So um, Tom Jefferson and colleagues said, well, fine, well, we'll speak to the author of the of the systematic review that they had based their own review on, uh, Dr. Kaiser, could they please see the data? So he said, I'm afraid you'll have to go to Roche. So they then went to the individual trialists, the two papers published, one in JAMA, one in The Lancet. Could we see the data? And both the authors said, we don't have it, you'll have to go to Roche. So the Cochrane reviewers, commissioned by the British government to do this review, wrote to Roche to say, can we please see the data in order that we can advise the British government as to whether they should buy this drug? or continue buying it, as they had already bought it in some numbers. But, um, and Roche didn't do anything, really. They, they sort of hummed and ahed and silence. Until Channel 4, the British television company, and the BMJ in partnership um, got involved, at which point Roche began to seem a little bit more anxious and keen to act. And they said, yes, they would provide the data. They would provide the Cochrane collaboration with the data, only though if Cochrane signed a confidentiality agreement, which would not only mean they couldn't share their results or the base of the results, but they wouldn't be able to tell anyone that they'd actually signed a confidentiality agreement. So um, for reasons I think were quite understandable, the Cochraneites decided not to sign this agreement. And on the basis of that, Roche said they wouldn't provide the data. Um, but they did in the BMJ promise, after we had made a song and dance about this, they did promise that they would provide what they felt was necessary for the Cochraneites to, to do what they needed. The Cochrane Collaboration published their review, which said they couldn't now say that this drug was effective. And four flu seasons later, and £500 million worth of UK NHS money spent on this drug later, we still don't have the data. So the British government has stockpiled this drug. The drug is now 
to my, I mean, everyone's amazement, is on the WHO essential drugs list, along with aspirin um, and other drugs that one might say were essential. Um, and we still don't have the data. We know that there are about 125, 130 trials, that 60% of the data have never seen the light of day, that there has been no independent, this is a really important point, to my, and I still can't believe it, no independent verification about the effects of this drug. We think the evidence suggests that it might reduce symptoms for a day or two, but it's never been compared against paracetamol, which also reduces the symptoms of flu. Um, we also know that it has some adverse effects, but exactly what those are remains slightly murky. So um, we, we published an investigative piece from Deborah Cohen about this whole question about how, how this had happened, how come we don't know. This, this revealed that the two trials published in JAMA and The Lancet were ghost-written, so that meant the experts involved had um, been given the data and written, written up the report without actually having done a great deal to deserve their authorship. Um, we also published this rather marvellous piece by Peter Doshu, who's one of the Cochranites, which included this fantastic table, which shows you that we've got contradictory statements um, made about the potential benefits of this drug. And you'll see that in Europe, it, it does work against complications. In America, it doesn't. And at the top, you'll see Roche, both for and against. So at the top on the left is Roche in Europe saying it does work against complications and here Roche in America saying it doesn't work against complications and this very helpful thing on the American website this website is intended for US audiences only so um, we've got a situation where science is apparently telling us two very separate things in different parts of the world um, where this gets on to conflict of interest at a different level is the this extent to which uh, the guidelines that led to the declaration of a pandemic and led to people stockpiling this drug um, come from. And again, we published this uh, investigation piece by Deborah Cohen and Phil Carter, looking at the decision making within WHO about how to about whether there was a pandemic and what should be done about it. Now, at the time of the pandemic, WHO had set up a, a, a committee, but the membership of the committee was um, confidential. So there's 60 people on this committee, and nobody was allowed to find out who they were. And WHO's reason for saying this was because they didn't want this committee to be, um, to be sort of, I don't know, <laughs> lobbied or bothered or whatever the word is. Um, so we had some evidence that it included people with fun industry links and indeed when the names eventually were uh, uncovered that did prove, prove to be true not many of them just just one or two but it was more the secrecy around the committee in the first case that, that led one to be a bit suspicious um, but the purpose of this committee and um, some of the evidence they were using was to decide when would the when the pandemic would be triggered at which point governments would be encouraged to start stockpiling the vaccine and the antivirals and when you go back in that that became less of an issue when you look back at the um, guidance about stockpiling it all links back to some guidance written in about 1998 by a, a committee itself entirely funded by the drug industry so it's a question of looking back you have to go back and back and back and back and then somewhere in there and in this case in quite a substantial fashion guidance um, actually formulated by industry funded committees had talked about the importance of antivirals and why, why um, these drugs should be stockpiled. I, I, it's worth, if I've just got a moment, to mention a, another example that I came across with um, the role of conflict of interest affecting public policy in quite a substantial way. Back in the late 90s, I did a series of work on WHO, a series of articles on the World Health Organization. And one of the big debates at the time was whether WHO should focus on just the developing world, or whether it should take a, a full menu approach, it was called. So looking at the whole of healthcare, including obesity and rich world and a whole host of other issues, um, and chronic disease. Um, and there was a strong voice of people saying, look, there's enough problems in the developing world. Why doesn't WHO stick to its knitting and not worry about chronic disease in the, in the rich world? They, they've, they've got their money, they can cope with this. 
And I, in all innocence, wrote these articles in the BMJ, including this point that actually, for goodness sake, why didn't WHO focus where the need was and stop trying to do everything? Um, and it was only when Gro Harlem Brundtland became the Director General that there was talk about the fact that WHO needed to come to get to grips with its, the influence of the tobacco industry. And as a result of the work that WHO did, to their great credit, it became clear that the lobbying, uh, asking WHO to stick to its knitting in the developing world and not take this full menu approach, had come largely from the tobacco industry. So what they were trying to do was just take everyone's attention away from smoking and the, t the effect of the tobacco industry. So the two people who wrote this report, which said, stick to your knitting, don't do the full, were both funded by the tobacco industry. So, I mean, it was, to me, an enormous shock because I had, as a journalist and an editor, written about this in all innocence. Um, and it made me really, really begin to think about what is going on below, what do we not know about, how, how, how cynical and suspicious do we have to be in order to try to understand the influences of things going on around us. WHO is an enormously vulnerable position, and I was very impressed by the fact that they took that all so seriously. Um, I'm going to just come back to the missing data thing, because although the Tamiflu story is one story, there are, there are other examples of it, and I, it is about conflict of interest, because we're talking about intentional, not missing, as we called it in this cover of the BMJ, but hidden. So we're trying to use the word hidden data. Um, and this is a, 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 German, a, a story of German heroism. Heroism in Germany by your wonderful Ickwig, um, which is, I mean, I'm a, just an enormous fan. Um, and this is a study published in the BMJ about this drug, Reboxetine, which is an antidepressant. It's not an SSRI, it's an SNRI, is that right? Um, so it's a slightly different type of drug. Um, and what these um, people at Ickwig did was they said to Pfizer, who produced this drug, we have a sense that we're not getting all the data. And unless you give us all the data, we're not, gonna, we're not going to approve your drug for reimbursement by the health insurance companies. And Pfizer said, no, no, we, we're not going to give you it. And then so they said, well, fine. If you don't give us the data, we're not going to approve your drug. So Pfizer then gave them the data. And it turned out that about 75% of the data had never been published before. And when you um, look at the, um, the different outcomes, this is remission from depression. This is um, adverse events, and this is with uh, more adverse events. So, so if you look at remission, um, and this side, of, if the dots are on this side, it will show that the control treatment is better, and this side, that raboxetine is better. And you look at remission outcome, and you say, well, the published data found that raboxetine was better. The unpublished data found that raboxetine was no different. And when you joined them together, there was really not much difference between the raboxetine and the uh, control treatment. Similarly with response, treatment published data shows good response, unpublished shows almost none, um, together almost none. And then here you have adverse events here, the reverse is true. So the published data show no problem with adverse events, the unpublished data show substantial problem with adverse events, and the two together show a problem with adverse events. So what these, the true data show is that this drug is not only ineffective, but also harmful. And I thought I'd just pick up on the basic science side of this whole business, because one of the things that, after we published this, I got a really interesting contact from a science journalist, because it turns out that raboxetine is the poster child drug for animal models for testing other antidepressants. Have I, does this, just such a surprise. So if you, if you put a rat, if you have a rat, and you hang it by its tail, it struggles a bit. If you give it this drug, um, I suppose you have to have a depressed rat to start with. Anyway, <laughs> if you give a depressed rat this drug, it struggles more when you hold it by its tail. If you give a depressed rat this drug, it swims faster across water than if you don't. So this, the basic scientists think this drug, this drug is a very good model for depression in rats. And therefore, because it was thought to work in humans, it was being used as a way to compare other potential antidepressants in rats that would then go on to be used in humans. Do you see what I mean? So if you wind this back and realize that the data on this drug show it doesn't work in humans, all of that basic science work that's been doing to find new antidepressants is flawed. So basic science um, does get affected backwards, if you see what I mean, by flawed human research. Anyway. Wonderful, heroic, fantastic, Ickwig 
five star. And this is the wonderful Beata and all her colleagues telling us subsequently about what they had to do to get this information. I mean, what a nonsense this is that we could be giving drugs to patients and our health systems paying for them without knowing this information. Drug studies are a tale of hide and seek. And this lovely picture of, you know, look, I mean, what, how ridiculous. Um, and in an editorial that accompanied this, I love this phrase, from Elizabeth Loder, who's an editor on the BMJ, and Richard Lehman, who's a fantastic GP in, in, in the UK. There is an Alice in Wonderland feel to these investigators' efforts, acting on the public's behalf, searching over hill and dale, and among the paperwork of regulatory bodies and drug companies, to put together pieces of data that should have been freely available in the first place. So, I mean, it does seem ridiculous. And then concealment of data should be regarded as the serious ethical breach that it is, and clinical researchers who fail to disclose data should be subject to disciplinary action by professional organisations. So that's the answer, I think, to the point, when does it become fraud? When we're talking about purposeful concealment of data, I consider that misconduct of the highest order and, and absolutely um, damaging and fraudulent. Um, now, the question is whether there should be legislation or whether um, uh, disciplinary action by professional organisations, and that's a, that's a, a conversation we can have um, later. So, uh, story moves on, and GSK suddenly decides it's going to become wonderfully ethical and announces it's going to make its data available. Um, and slightly inspired by that, I have to say, we, the BMJ, decided we would... Um, bring in a new policy, which I tried to get the other journals to take on board, but they so far are not keen to do, which is to say we will only publish research trials if the authors of the trials will commit on submitting their paper to making their trial data freely available to others on reasonable request. That's the phrase we've used, uh, which is uh, very subjective. We understand that. Um, but at least it's a beginning, and the reasonable request will be monitored via our rapid responses on bmj.com. So if, uh, if someone wants to see the data, we'll tell them to put up on the website why they want to do that, and the authors of the study will have to say, if they don't want to share their data, explain why. So we think a little bit of sunshine onto the system will help. Um, we also uh, have, have been pushing for access to the data by other means, which is really just to put the whole thing in the public domain, and we've published uh, this open data campaign uh, where we've, this is specifically about oseltamivir, but we're also going to be doing it for the other antiviral drug, um, Relenza, which is produced by GSK. Um, and we've got the correspondence with Roche. This is over three years between the Cochrane collaboration and the pharmaceutical company, just saying um, that literally all the emails. It took about, I don't know, 100 hours of work getting it up there, but it'll take you a couple of hours to read it. It is quite fun, um, and it just shows you how very tenacious um, the Cochranites have had to be to try to keep going on this. Um, and we've also put up there the correspondence between the Cochrane Collaboration and these other groups, World Health Organization, CDC, EMA, NICE, um, just to show what's going on behind the scenes. And um, there's a campaign now which you can all sign up to, alltrials.net, which is uh, trying to get all trials registered and all results received, uh, reported. So, I'm nearly through. Conflicts of interest, what we know and what we don't. Well, we know that conflicts of interest affect the evidence base for healthcare and public health, uh, affect gu the guidelines created from this evidence base, um, and the decisions taken about what we spend our healthcare resources on. And I think, importantly, all of these influences tend towards overtreatment. So, um, I mean, there are, I'm not saying there isn't undertreatment and underdiagnosis and unrecognized need. And the drug industry in particular will always say, well, we need to make people aware of new treatments, otherwise nobody will use them. But overwhelmingly, the evidence is that, that we're talking about overuse of treatment as a result of um, the absence of data. Um, and I should say that the BMJ has another campaign, as well as our open data campaign, called Too Much Medicine which is really intended to try to um, unpick some of those relationships about why we overuse um, certain medicines. So, other things we know and, what, and don't, we are still not getting conflicts of interest sufficiently often declared. Uh, we're still not agreed on what should be declared and to whom. So, should, should the journal know about it but, or the, and the public not? 
or um, should we make all these things freely, transparently open? I think we should. How do we manage relations between physicians, research and industry? Eric's talked a lot about that, very important. And how do we do so in the best interest of patients and the public? We're still uncertain about how to manage conflicts of interest once they're declared. Um, and I just thought to end with, I wanted to talk about the fact that we're blind to some types of conflict of interest. So um, this is an example of that. Here is a paper published in PLOS Medicine about is private healthcare the answer to the health problems of the world's poor? And this is the authors of this paper, one of whom is my predecessor, Richard Smith. Um, and at the end of the paper, um, they declared their conflicts of interest, this very lengthy thing here. Um, now, um, let me just check. The, um, I think importantly, I need to explain that this was one side of a debate, and they were arguing no. Oh, sorry. They were arguing yes. Sorry. Richard Smith and his colleagues were arguing yes, private health care is an answer. And there was another part of the debate where they were arguing no, it's not. And on the yes side, private, private health care is helping the poor. Um, the, the authors gave this great long scree about their conflicts of interest. But on the no side, written by academics, they said they didn't have any conflicts of interest. And Richard Smith argues, and I think he's got a very good point, that the no side might have had a conflict of interest statement as follows. It came from, they came from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, so they're very pure, pure as the driven so academics who's, who don't have a conflict of interest in the world. But he says, well, they do, actually, because they might have said, we work in an organisation, people are strongly committed to the public sector, we probably would not have been selected for our jobs and would not have advanced through if we weren't similarly committed. We do... Do you see what I mean? It's, it's the other side of this. It's the public sector conflict of interest to which we are so often blind. Um, I think Bernard mentioned that we need to be clear about people's roles when we talk about conflict of interest, and, um, and maybe we're not often enough clear about this. So this is just an example of, I think, where we did get it right. A lot of the more interesting conflicts of interest we publish in the BMJ come in the letters section, the rapid responses. And this is um, a person who was writing about... Uh, uh, treatment and was concerned about SSRI use in an article in JAMA and he wrote this letter for us and here's his conflict of interest um, um, you know he talks about I've been a member of no free lunch spent my membership dues are behind I teach class in physician pharmaceutical industry highly skeptical of the profit motive in healthcare and written a number of letters to the editor. So, you know, this is a, a very full and thorough and detailed conflict of interest, and maybe we need to see more of that, where the non-financial side, that one's attitudinal conflicts are, are made clear as well. So, briefly now, what needs to happen? Do we need legislation? Do we need professional sanctions when people fail to do what they should? Uh, do we need a culture change? And I would say, yes, we need all three of those things. <laughs> Uh, which is perhaps um, dodging the arguments. But just to end with um, one of my heroes, um, who is a psychiatrist, Giovanni Fava, from Italy, and um, he uh, takes the view that financial conflicts of interest, certainly in psychiatry, are endemic, and we've got to move um, away from that. And he would like to see, and I, I think it's a very marvellous suggestion, lines of support to independent researchers who are free of substantial conflicts of interest. So instead of the people with, instead of people being given financial rewards um, and then getting career rewards for having those, so building a sort of virtuous circle as you take the money from industry, you get the opportunities and you end up on the platforms and you end up in the guideline panel, you end up editing the journals, that it's the reverse, that actually if you don't take those financial rewards, that's, that's when you get promoted and offered the research grants from NIH and the editorships of the New England Journal and all those things that flow from keeping yourself free from conflicts of interest. Conflict, oh, sorry. Conflict free investigation of reviews should be emphasised in training and continuing medical education and should have priority in medical journals and that's certainly something we work towards at the BMJ. I haven't talked enough about big food. That's for, um, for Gerd. Big food. We've got big pharma. We need to think about big food. Um, I'm fascinated by the by the industry influence on our diet, and um, we're going to be doing a lot more of this in the BMJ. Uh, where did the five? Of, do you have five a day in Germany? You have to eat your five a day. Yeah. Vegetables and fruit. 
Apparently, it was the Californian fruit farmers. You know, that's where it all began. They wanted to sell their fruit, so they managed to get that message through by routes that I can't remember. The, um, the corn farmers in America, high fructose corn syrup, they had, a, they had a lot of corn syrup they needed to get rid of, so um, they managed to you know, make it okay to have all this corn syrup in our diet. Um, and are very happy, I think, with the idea that fat is the big, the big... I'm having some... I don't know if that's agreement or disagreement, but it'll be... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it, I'm speaking without a lot of detail here, but I, it's an area that needs investigation. So let's do the drug industry, yes, of course. Let's do physician conflict of interest, fee-for-service, all of that side of things. We've got to look at that. But let's not forget big food. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fiona, for this excellent overview, and thank you very much especially for not only showing us uh, complex fields of conflict of interest, but also showing us what are the negative consequences for our healthcare system and especially for our patients, I think. Questions to Dr. Gottlieb. I heard by rumor almost that the missing data uh, campaign initiated by you and Ben Goldacre has, has uh, made an impact uh, at the parliamentary level in the UK. Can you tell us about this? Um, well, we hope it has. We've got a very good ally, Sarah Wollaston, who's, a, who's, a, who's an MP, um, Member of Parliament in the UK, and um, she has got the issue of um, Oseltamivir, Tamiflu, referred to our National Audit Office. So the other day I had a very strange visitation from these two suited gentlemen who looked like, do, is, do you know the word bailiff? You know, someone who comes to do your debt collection. Um, they turned up in my office, hello, Dr. Goodley. Uh, we've come to find out about Tamiflu. You know, it was like being sort of suddenly in a different world. Anyway, they were looking at the money and um, they are doing a very thorough look at whether Tamiflu is value for money. And if they come to the view that um, it may not be, they will refer it to our public accounts committee. Uh, which a few months ago had Google, Starbucks, and Amazon um, in the spotlight for not paying their taxes in the UK. So I think you can foresee a situation in a few months' time where Roche will be up in front of the Public Accounts Committee in the UK arguing why or trying to defend the decision £500 million spent on Tamiflu. Now, one of the things I've heard is that this, this discussion needs to happen at the European level because the British government is understandably worried about losing pharmaceutical um, business. So we do need to take a global view of this. It's, it's hard for individual countries to take, take it like that. But I, I'm very pleased that that is happening because it does send a very strong signal. As a clinical researcher, you see, we sometimes try to get the original data if we do trials with drug companies. What recently happened is you see that they finally they give us the raw data, but they give us two weeks to have a look at 400 tables of raw yes, data. Yes. And you see then, of course, it's again, you say it's not a way to get out of the problem of statistics. Who is mm. doing the statistics? Who uh, is able actually to do the uh, conclusions, to draw the conclusions out of these trials from pharma industry? Mm. I think that's very... Do you have a solution? See, I have no solution. I, I'm also editor of a, a journal. You see, it's very, very difficult. Yes. See, I don't e think I have a solution. Even if you get raw data. And you see, I think the regulator is in a, in a similar difficult position because they get these great... The, the, the industry will say, we've given them all the data. Um, and Tom Jefferson calls it swamping bias, where you're given all this information, but you haven't got the resources to actually interpret it. So I do think that's a big problem. And, and one answer is that we just need more eyes on... You know, that, that's an example of why having the data available to a lot of people to look at um, is a good, ex good solution. And the, the example that Bernard talked about with the Vandia, it was um, um, Steve Nissen who, who happened to be able to dig into the FDA database and find this information, which the FDA itself hadn't tracked down. So this is kind of crowdsourcing is, is one way to try to um, solve the problem. I don't know if anyone's got a better solution, but... Uh, I don't have a better solution to it. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the fraudulent article on the MMR and the, the Wakefield uh, case. Um, I was following at the time, and I, I thought it's one thing to go after somebody like Wakefield, who was 
basically down at the moment. But I think you and Lancet are the big journals in, in England. Um, so I think it's also a social and cultural and personal issue involved. And I was surprised how, let's put it aggressive, you went after the Lancet as mm. well. So I remember they asked uh, Richard Horton after it, how do you deal with it? And he just said, well, move on. Mm. Um, I'm very curious. I, I imagine you meet twice a week in a club or somewhere. How, how did it work? Um, it, it's... it's uh it's a very good question, and it's a, it's one I am very happy to answer. But it's not a good it's, it's not a good situation, and um, of course, actually, in the context of doing what we did, it was that that caused me the most personal grief, if you like, because yes, we are have a kind of collegiate relationship. Journals, uh, we traditionally meet once a year. The big journals have done for the last thirty years, um, and I've taken that you know my my responsibility to work closely with the other journals very seriously. Um, but I think as a higher duty, without wanting to sound too uh, holier than thou, as a higher duty is the duty to medicine and science. And I, and I think um, the, the thing that seemed important was that we had this information and people knew we had this information. And if I had failed to, if I'd done the, the Wakefield bit and not done the, the journal bit, people would have, we would have become colluding with the situation. So it was very, very difficult, and the answer is Richard Horton and I are not speaking. He doesn't speak to me, so... <laughs> I can't put it nicer than that. We speak, the journals interact at a, at a different level, um, but he, he doesn't speak to me. Professor Müller-Arlinghausen. You expressed your sympathy with my Italian colleague, uh, Giovanni Fava. Uh, I also like uh, his work very much. He's an Italian now working with uh, a famous Boston uh, group. What is so interesting, interesting in the work of this fellow is that he is practically the only psychiatrist who pointed to potential harmful, unfavorable effects of long-term treatment, treatment with antidepressants. Mm. And the interesting thing is that he actually did not create new data but he looked at data which were already there and put them together in a, in a theory on potential harmful effects of uh, long-term treatment with antidepressants. And I think it has something to do with his independent uh, personality or mm. with his independent attitude that he was able to look at these data with an independent uh, I, mm. which shows how important it is to mm. be independent uh, mm. and have no affiliations with the, with the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add, to add to the journal issue, you are really in a difficult position because journals may be part of the solution of these problems, but they are also a major, substantial part causing these problems. Mm. I mean, this is just true. And mm. for example, was as one ongoing example in the UK where one of the biggest RCTs ever, the worm trial, is still not published by the Lancet and reviewers are waiting for it for a year or more. And the researchers involved in it, are one, they are the most famous group in the world from Oxford. Mm. So that's what I said in the beginning. It's not an industry problem. Mm. It's a much, much bigger problem. And Unfortunately, John's on the middle of it. But I think in that case, so this is deworming, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, the, that trial, it's not the Lancet's fault. The, 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 the study was finished in 2005, and Rich, Richard Pito has only just finished writing it up. So, I mean, you know, and, and part of the reason was that the study results were different to those he expected. I mean, you know this, but just to explain. So here's a big study of of the biggest study ever of deworming in children in the developing world. And people expected it to show that deworming worked, and it found that deworming didn't work. So Richard Pito and his colleagues were very concerned, and they went back and back and back to check, check, check. And the result is that this study has been very slow, so nearly, I don't know, seven, eight years to get out. Um, and in the meantime, this treatment is being used, and money is being spent, and there are a lot of people... So it's an example of a non-industry funded, this is, a, this is a public sector study, where the researchers have been very slow to get the results out. You know, um, I, think, I think that's a very good point, yeah. But I, I wouldn't say it's the journal's fault, it's not the Lancet's fault, that one. My, in my, to my understanding, that, that's a researcher problem. 
the whole building, maybe. Um, I have two short questions. The first one, referring to your campaign that you will publish only clinical trial data if you are available of the clinical study reports. What Could you speculate why the other journals do not follow this proposal at the well, moment? Well, I think it's important to say we publish many fewer drug trials than the other journals. So it's not, and I said this in the editorial, it's not going to affect us nearly as much. Um, and we also get much less reprint revenue from um, drug trials. So I think there is, a, you know, there's a both an editorial and a commercial concern for journals that a journal like the New England Journal gets big, big money from reprint revenue, um, and they don't want to piss off the um, drug industry. I mean, put it frankly. So um, I think they've got much more to lose than we have. So it's easy for us to do this, and I'm very pleased we're doing it. But um, I was surprised because of that. I was surprised how much. Um, Effect how much interest it caused. I, I didn't see it as a very big step when we public when we announced it, but it does seem to have caused some stir. I mean, I very much hope that the other journals will follow suit. But uh, the other question refers to the email. I think you attended the meeting in Brussels regarding that they will publish together with the European Public Assessment Reports also the clinical study reports, yes. you feel that this will happen in the near future? Well, it's such an interesting one, this. So if, I don't know how many of you know that the European Medicines Agency has said it will publish now, it will make available the, um, the patient data for all the drugs it has assessed, whether it's approved them or not. That's the plan from 2014 onwards. Um, they're actually being sued by two drug companies um, f to try to prevent them from doing this. That's just recent news. Um, the details of that are, are as yet unreleased. Um, the uh, question is what they mean by what they will make available. And um, people like Tom Jefferson and others who spend their time and Gert looking at this kind of information are struggling to understand are they meaning really patient data or are they meaning something less than that. And I think there's lots of uncertainty about that. So there's a lot of work to be done. If these two drug companies succeed in suing the EMA and preventing them from doing this, then we're in a whole nother, a whole nother situation. But the EMA, the new, the new EMA leadership, I think, is to be really applauded. So um, Guido Rassi and um, Hans, Hans Georg Eichler, really excellent, and all the support you can give them, um, really, uh, we, we're 100% we're behind them. Other questions from the audience? In fact, uh, first I would like to add on uh, what the EMA does is one thing at the moment, or will do, hope, hopefully, and the other thing, that's, that's only voluntary in a way, yeah? and the important thing is that now that the clinical trials regulation is discussed in the European Parliament, there also has been at least a clause in which is about access to the data in the end, and there's heavy lobby for industry to get this out again. So that's another area why, where people should become active. Yes. That was just more comment. And then I have a question on, has mentioned earlier, on peer review, whether peer review is really good enough to, um, um, uh, to uncover pub, um, conflict of interest, mm. unpublished parts of data, and so on. Mm. Or whether it's rather just gives us a good feeling. It's better than nothing, mm. I would agree. but. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think peer review is very, very limited. Um, I mean, it's, 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 I'm a fan of peer review. Uh, any of us who've had our work peer reviewed will think it's been improved as a result. I'm speaking for myself, everything I've published, written by myself, I send out to as many people as I can think of before publishing it so that I don't make a fool of myself. So I think peer review is a good thing. Um, but I think it's also potentially open to abuse and it's slow and it's costly and you know many many problems with it um, it's not very good always at picking up error and it can be very not very good at picking up fraud so I think we know that peer review is is, is limited in what it can do um, I think that it's not going to be necessarily very good at picking up the sorts of problems we have because the peer reviewer like the editor has only what the authors have provided them to look at so we're we're not in a position to say you know you've missed out these data very easily because we don't know. So I think that it, peer review is not going to help this situation on its own. There's got to be a whole other requirement for transparency that will be brought in, and that, that's the challenge. I don't know if you, if you agree. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it's the best we've got, but it's not, not going to solve it. Um, you mentioned as one, maybe one solution to the problem, legislation. 
do you have any suggestions? What kind of legislation? Who and what? And well, where? we heard earlier that legislation, you know, it, 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 I don't know, was it Bernard or was it Eric mentioned about the FDA Amendment Act? Um, we know that the, despite legislation in the US, um, we know that about less, less than half of registered trials are published within 30 months of completion. So the FDA Amendment Act requires that, but it's not being done even in that population of studies. Um, so, I mean, legislation is only going to be part of the picture, and there's all the expense of auditing and chasing up. And um, I think a lot of the, uh, the um, in addition to legislation, and maybe Europe can do better than the FDA Amendment Act. We need a better, we need a better thing in Europe. Um, but we need professionalism. We need, we need professional sanctions. We need people to know that, you know, in, in medicine, it's not okay to take money from doctors, from the pharmaceutical industry if you're treating patients. And um, in research, um, you know, we need a whole host of professional changes. But I, I mentioned over the break that if I was on Eric's continuum, the place that I would put a definite stop is phase three and four trials. I don't think the pharmaceutical industry should fund or perform those trials. I think they should be independently run, independently funded by money, perhaps, that the industry puts into a central pot. So phase one and two, and as Eric said, basic science. But I think there comes a point when, when because the legislation isn't working, because we aren't getting access to the data, we cannot trust industry to evaluate its own products, I'm afraid. So that's where I put my line in the sand. I do not totally agree with the statement regarding basic science. We know, for example, in oncology, that basic science is very poor at the moment because we have a lot of non-reproducible results mm. and therefore only five out of 100 new drugs entering clinical phase one, two, three will get market approval. I think we have also to concentrate mm. that in the early basic science, there is not too much negative influence mm. from people who are not really interested to get the real improvement in drug therapy. Therefore, I think basic science, of course, it's much more interesting to have influence on phase four trials after approval, but basic science is extremely relevant, especially in the emerging fields of oncology, etc. Mm. I think. Other questions from the audience? No, it's not a question, it's a comment. When you move over there, I think beyond that, that point, the whole process has to be taken away from the drug approval process. So we just had a recent experience here in the Bavarian parliament, for example, about Tamiflu, where they discussed it. In the end, they referred it back to the German drug approval agency. So even, I think it was approved in 99, so even 14 years later, the arguments are still not on the benefit harm side, but they are still treated as a drug approval issue. Mm. And I think this is a major problem because then it still remains in the industry area. Mm. And there's no clear cut beyond that point to the nice ICVIC field. The decisions are still based on the approval side. Mm. And that's based on, on industry data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, nevertheless, more than 11 years after the Medical Professionalism Charter has been published, there's a lot to do, and I think your ex no, examples have shown that we have really to concentrate on the right areas and to improve the situation for our patients. This is extremely important. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Dr. Thank Gordon. you very much.